I greet you all and welcome you to the Manifested e-learning platform. Today we continue with the subject public sector governance, policy and administration. We are moving on to chapter number four, public policy and national development. That is the title, public policy and national development. Under this chapter, there are nine sub chapters. One, classical and you know, classical models of development. Two, the role of the state in development. Three, the political economy of development. Four, linkage of public administration and public policy. Five, linkage between national and county development plans. Six, national and county plans and policies. Seven, stakeholders involvement in development planning. Eight, characteristics of effective plans and policies. Nine, challenges of public policy formulation and implementation. We will be tackling a sub chapter one at a time, beginning with the classical and neoclassical models of development. The chapter is public policy and national development. Now, before we get into the first sub chapter, we need to first understand the key terms here. That is public policy and national development. Let's define the key terms, public policy and national development. Now, public policy refers to a set of principles, actions and laws including regulations and priorities that are adopted by the government to address societal issues and achieve specific goals. So public policy is a set of principles, actions, laws, regulations, and priorities that are adopted by the government to address societal issues and achieve specific goals. And public policy encompasses a wide range of areas, including economic policy, social policy, environmental policy, foreign policy, and so on. So it's important for you to understand that governments are put in place to solve societal issues. And for government to solve issues in the community or in a country, it has to come up with a set of principles, actions, regulations, and priorities that can now guide its actions in solving public problems. And public policy has various characteristics. For example, uh, public policies are purposeful, meaning that they are designed to achieve specific outcomes or address identified problems. Public policy is also authoritative. That is to say, they are formulated and implemented by government bodies or their representatives. Public policy may be also impactful, which is to say that they have real world consequences, shaping the lives of citizens and the direction of a nation. They may also be dynamic, meaning that they evolve over time in response to changing circumstances, changing information, or shifting of priorities. And there are various examples of public policy. A company or a country may have for example, an economic policy, which may deal with the taxation laws, interest rate policies, uh, trade agreements, things to do with the regulations and regulation of business and so on. That's an example of public policy. Another example is social policy. A country may have 
social policy, which deals with welfare programs, healthcare, uh, education policies, anti-discrimination laws, and so on. We could also have environmental policy, which deals with regulations on pollution, conservation efforts. Then lastly, another example of a public policy is a foreign policy, which deals with the diplomatic relations, trade agreements, military alliances, and so on. So that is the meaning of public policy. Public policy. Then there is national development. What's the meaning of the term national development? Now, national development refers to the multifaceted process of improving the overall well-being and standards of living of uh, citizens of a nation. It encompasses economic growth, social progress, environmental sustainability, and good governance. All right, national development. Now, the key dimensions of national development are economic development, environmental development, political development, and so on. We may have also social development. And economic development refers to the increasing of a nation's wealth, productivity, and income levels. That's the meaning of economic development. Social development, on the other hand, refers to improving education, healthcare, housing, and the social services to the people in order to enhance the people's quality of life. On the other hand, another aspect of national development is environmental development, which involves protecting and preserving national resources and ecosystems to ensure sustainable development. So national development has various aspects, political development, social development, environmental development, and political development, which involves establishing democratic institutions, promoting human rights, and ensuring good governance. Ensuring good governance. So that those are the various aspects of national development, and there are various indicators of national development. For economic development, the indicator of economic development could be the gross domestic product or the GDP per capita. Uh, it can also, another indicator could be employment rates, poverty rates. Those are indicators of economic development. Now, the indicators of social development are literacy levels or literacy rates, life expectancy, access to health care, access to education, and gender equality. Those are indicators of social development. If you want to know the level of social development of a nation, you look at the 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 housing. How is the um, that need being met? Housing. Do all the citizens have houses? Do citizens have access to social services? So those are indicators of social development. You look at the literacy levels, life expectancy, access to healthcare and education and so on. As for the political indicators, one can observe the level of democracy. Uh, you, you observe or consider things like freedom of speech, the rule of law, corruption levels, and so on. Those are indicators of political development. 
Then there is also environmental development. What are the indicators of environmental development? Indicators could be air and water quality, deforesta de de deforestation rates, uh, carbon emissions, and so on. So do you understand, candidates, that national development has four key aspects or dimensions economic development, social development, environmental development, political development. And if you want to check the level of development, the level of, of, the level of national development, you consider the four areas and they are, each has its own indicators. Uh, for example, I've said economic development, the indicator could be the GDP. Social development could be literacy levels, life expectancy. Environmental development, you look at the deforestation rates, the carbon emissions, the quality of water, quality of air. For political development, you may consider the, 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 the level of uh, democracy, freedom of speech, the rule of law, the corruption levels, and so on. So that is what we mean by national development and public policy. We've said that public policy is a set of rules uh, is a set of um, principles that guide government action. You understand? And there is an interplay candidates between public policy and national development. Public policy plays a crucial role in shaping the trajectory of national development. There is no way a country can develop without having proper public policy. There is the interplay between the two. Effective policies can foster economic growth, it can reduce uh, poverty, can improve social well-being, and protect the environment. Conversely, poor or poorly designed or implemented policies can hinder development and increase or exacerbate the, the, the existing problems. So there is always an interplay between the two. National development is dependent on public policy. It's dependent on public policy. If the country has uh, well uh, developed or formulated policy which is also properly implemented, then they, that may lead to improvement in the lives of the people, the economic lives, the political lives, and the environment may also improve. So it's important for us to first of all understand the key terms, public policy and national development, before moving to the first topic, subtopic, which is classical and neoclassical models of development. That is the first subtopic. Classical and neoclassical models of development. Classical and neoclassical models of development. Now, let us begin with the classical models. Classical models. Classical models. The classical models. Now, the classical school of economic thought was developed by the likes of Adam Smith, uh, the likes of uh, David Ricardo, and the models emerged during the 18th and 19th century. Emerged during, emerged 
these classical models emerged during the 18th and 19th centuries. The theory were primarily represented by presented by Adam Smith, David Ricardo, and they might during the 18th centuries. The theory laid the foundation for understanding how economies function and grow. And here are the key principles of the classical model. Key principles. The first key principle is lay says fair. Lay says fair. Lay says fair. Economics. Lay says fair. Economics. Now, classical economists advocated for minimal government intervention in the economy. They believe that markets left to their own devices would naturally reach equilibrium through the forces of demand and supply. And that force the forces of demand on one hand and the forces of supply, which is viewed as the invisible hand, would guide resources to their most efficient use, leading to economic growth. Lay says fair means free reign. Little or no government intervention in the economy. That's the key principle of the first principle of the classical models. Two, the second principle is comparative advantage. Comparative advantage. Now, this principle suggests that nations should specialize in producing goods and services they can produce most efficiently and trade with other countries for goods they less they are less efficient at producing so for example if kenya is good at producing gold then kenya should specialize in producing gold then if kenya is efficient at producing gold then Kenya should specialize in the, in the production of gold. Then it trades the gold with other countries for goods that is less at producing efficiently. You understand? Specialization. And that specialization and trade would lead to overall production and consumption for all the countries that are involved. So each country should specialize in what it produces most efficiently. Comparative advantage. The third key principle is capital accumulation. Capital accumulation. Capital accumulation. Now, classical economists emphasize the importance of saving and investing as drivers of economic growth. And by accumulating capital, which involves machinery, equipment, infrastructure, countries would increase their productivity and generate more wealth. Countries would do what? Would increase their productive capacity and generate more wealth. So these principles have some implications on the economy or policy. Do you understand? There are implications of these 
principles on public policy. What are the policy implications of the classical model? One we have stated is minimal government intervention. Minimal government intervention. Now, classical economists advocated for limited government involvement in the economy, primarily focusing on enforcing property rights, enforcing contracts, and providing essential public goods. The first implication is that the government should have limited uh, inter in intervention or involvement in the economy and the government should focus on enforcing property rights, enforcing contracts and providing the essential public goods and services like defense, roads, infrastructure and so on. So that's the first policy implication of a classical model. Number two, free trade. The model promoted trade policies, free trade policies, it advocated for free trade policies, arguing that reducing trade barriers would allow countries to specialize according to their comparative advantage and benefit from international trade. And that is because of the comparative advantage. Remember we said that countries should produce or specialize in production of goods that they can produce um, eff eff efficiently. And if countries are to specialize, then it means that they have to rely on other countries for the goods that they do not produce. And therefore there is need to have free trade policies that would reduce um, trade barriers and allow countries to specialize and then trade amongst each other or with each other. International trade. Three sound money, sound money. The classical models emphasize the importance of a stable currency and avoiding inflation because such factors would disrupt economic activity and hinder growth. So these are three key policy implications of the classical models which emerged during the 18th and 19th centuries. We say that the key principles, one is laissez-faire economics, two, comparative advantage and capital accumulation. Then uh, we had after the classical models, there is the Neoclassical models. The neoclassical models. The neoclassical models emerged in the late 19th and early 20th century, and these models built upon the classical ideas but incorporating new concepts. They introduced new concepts, but the concepts were built on the classical models. You understand? And the key principles of neoclassical models, key principles, 
of new classical models include marginal utility. One, marginal utility. Marginal utility. Neoclassical economies introduce the concept of marginal utility, which refers to the additional satisfaction or benefit consumers derive from consuming one more unit of a good or service. The concept helped explain this concept helped ex helped explain consumer behavior and how prices are determined in the market. So that is the first key principle of the neoclassical models. Marginal utility. Marginal means additional. Utility means satisfaction. Additional satisfaction. It helps uh, to understand consumer behavior. So that's the first principle. Two, rationality. Rationality is the second key principle of the neoclassical models. The neoclassical model economies assume that individuals and firms act rationally to maximize their self-interest and consumers aim to maximize utility while firms strive to maximize profit. So that is a, an assumption or a principle of neoclassical model that producers are rational in that they strive to maximize profits. The consumers are also rational, meaning that they are out to maximize their self-interest and to maximize their happiness or utility. That's the second principle. Number three is market equilibrium. Market equilibrium is a third principle. Neoclassical economies focused on the concept of market equilibrium where the quantity supplied of a good or service equals the quantity demanded at a particular price. They believe that markets tend towards equilibrium and any deviations from the equilibrium would be self-correcting. Market equilibrium is where the quantity of goods produced equal the quantity of goods supplied at a particular price. Then four, there is the role of technology and human capital. Role of technology and human capital. The role of technology and human capital. Unlike the classical economies who focus primarily on physical capital, neoclassical economies recognize the importance of technology uh, and also the importance of human capital, like education, skills, knowledge, as drivers of economic growth. Neoclassical uh, model economies argue that uh, technology and human capital are drivers of economic growth as opposed to the classical models where they did not factor in technology and human capital but only focused on equipment. Right? They only focused on physical capital as opposed to human capital. So these are four principles, marginal utility, rationality, market equilibrium, role of technology and human capital. Now what are the policy implications of the neoclassical models? Policy implications. What are the policy implications? First one is market-oriented policies.
market oriented policies. Neoclassical economies generally supported market oriented policies that promote competitive free trade and deregulation. They believe that markets are the most efficient mechanisms for allocating resources. So that's the first implication, market oriented policies. Then the second implication is investment in education and investment in education and technology. Investment in education and technology. They emphasize the importance of investing in education and technological innovation to enhance human capital and promote long-term to promote long-term economic growth. That's the second application of your classical model. Then there is limited but strategic government intervention limited but strategic government intervention now while favoring free trade neoclassical economists acknowledge that uh, there might be instances where government intervention is necessary to correct market failures a good example is uh, externalities uh, public goods or even providing social safety net. So these candidates are the two uh, models, the classical and neoclassical models of development. And that will mark the end of the lesson. I'm going to give you today's assignment. Question one. How do classical models of development differ from neoclassical models in their assumptions about the drivers of economic growth? Question two. What are the key criticisms of both classical and neoclassical models of development, particularly in their applicability to developing countries with diverse economic and social structures? Three. In what ways have neoclassical models of development influenced contemporary public policy debates, such as the emphasis on market liberalization and deregulation? Question four. To what extent do classical and neoclassical models of development adequately account for the role of institutions, technology, and human capital in the development process? Thank you. Bye.